Well, welcome to our Holocaust special. Today, well, at least for the next hour, we're going to be looking at Israel through the lens of the Holocaust, but really focusing on being inspired to live. You know, I've done so many funerals, and I always ask the funeral director, what can I learn from you? And they always say to me, appreciate life. So for the next hour, we're going to really learn to be inspired and to appreciate life through this incredible tragedy that happened not too many years ago. And I'm joined by my lovely wife, Melanie. Mm, thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you join us for this Holocaust special. And uh, seeing as though both Kurt and I have both had the privilege of doing some studies with the uh, Holocaust Museum Yad Vashem. And recently, I just got back actually, <laughs> recently uh, in December from doing 50 hours of Holocaust studies in Jerusalem. And that is probably uh, one of the, uh, I suppose, most profound experiences that I've had, had in my life. And hopefully we can share some of the things that we have learnt uh, through our Holocaust studies. Yeah, but you know, I did the same course that you did two years ago. And usually one goes to Israel, if you're a Christian, to see the, the holy sites. And right. we saw some of them, but you usually don't go to Israel for 50 hours of Holocaust studies. No. And I remember after those 50 hours, I was just so exhausted that I went down to the Dead Sea and just put mud all over <laughs> me and I tried my best to relax and that still didn't do it. So I went to Masada and I didn't take the cable car up. I walked all the way up just to get kind of energy and relax because it was intense. Yes, very intense. Yeah. Well, for me, it was going onto the streets and having a, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some street food, <laughs> usually a shawarma, mm -hmm. um, and then just talking to people and, and especially some of the religious Jews, they were absolutely fascinated. Mm -hmm. The Christians would take the time to come to Jerusalem and to put themselves through this, I suppose, quite a a heavy, heavy experience going through uh, the Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. But I just love the way that, uh, you know, there is a way of looking uh, in the Holocaust Museum of life and what life can hold for you, even if you have gone through such heinous things as many of the Holocaust survivors yeah. have done. Yeah, yeah. But it was amazing. I, I just, I mean, just how we got there in the first yes. place was amazing. About two and a half years ago, I'm not going to go into too many details, a woman came to our church and I didn't even know her. And then she had a prophecy for me, and she said that she saw me going on a trip, meeting with important officials, but I would go without my wife, all alone, and it would be, be international travel. Actually, so, it was invitation. An invitation, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. And then, a couple months later, my friend, well, our friend Stephen Hill, who's a politician in Northern Ireland, yeah. he sent me this form, mm. and he said, Kurt, I believe it's your time to go to Israel. And uh, if you fill out this form and you get accepted, they will pay everything except the airfare, your hotel, your studies and food and all of that. But thousands of people apply. And even my pastor got turned down and he has a church of 4,000 people. So I'm just saying, well, what hope is that? I, you know, there's no way I'm gonna go. Yeah. So anyway, I filled out the form at the last minute, probably more for him to save face than faith that I would actually go because so many people around the world were auditioning for this. And then I got an email saying, you're going. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. wow, he said to me, Kurt, <laughs> this experience, it's gonna change your life. Mm. And that's an understatement. I mean, yeah. how did that change your life? And how did you end up going? Well, actually the same person, Stephen Hill. <laughs> if you're watching Stephen, hello. <laughs> he also sent me the same form and he said, I've been praying and I believe the Lord is saying that you need to follow in your husband's footsteps and uh, you need to go and go to Jerusalem and do these Holocaust studies. Mm. So I thought to myself, well, how would I qualify? But anyway, I did, I wrote it. I wrote some of my, mm. uh, my story about being born in Kenya, being in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and then um, apartheid South Africa. And actually it was kind of interesting. So then I got my letter saying, mm. yes, you have been <laughs> uh, accepted. And uh, it's just being together with 30 people from around the world, we've been handpicked to be the educators and the people who would uh, pass on more of the information about, you know, what the Holocaust was about, keeping it alive, that we're talking about living and, uh, you know, the rise of anti-Semitism, all these things we studied and, and, and have come to understand. So today we want to give you some, some beautiful stories of people who have survived and things that are, uh, you know, just bringing life uh, in Israel and yeah. in Jerusalem right now. But just now. in a little moment, we're gonna have a photo put up on the screen and there's something that you didn't mention. 
okay, I made the mistake of doing the program, spending one extra day, and immediately coming back to Spain. And then Melanie says, you know what, I want to decompress after my mm. 50 hours. So we said, well, who do we know? We don't have a lot of money, so who do we know in Jerusalem? And, you know, Melanie and I said, well, what about your ex-boyfriend, Jonathan? Maybe <laughs> okay. he knows somebody Who's in Jerusalem. Who's an Orthodox <laughs> Jew. Maybe he knows somebody in Jerusalem. Friend, not, well, friend. Yeah, friend, that's right. Friend. And I think yes. he was in Johannesburg. He was also a lawyer, lawyer yeah. in New York City. And so Melanie calls Jonathan, searches his number, finds it on Google, and calls him, and guess where he's living? in all the world. He, he happens he to be said, living in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He said he'd been living there for 12 mm. years. So it was so lovely to reconnect. I think the thought really was that I wanted, with all these the studies on the Holocaust and the intensity of that, I wanted to be able to have an experience of seeing Israel, the Holocaust, and my experience, my first experience in Israel through Jewish eyes. And so it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. So really how, did great he, time. how did your... How did Jonathan see the Holocaust? Well, actually, it was more about how he sees is Israel now. Um, I think some of the Jews that live in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, really fear the, the, the Holocaust Museum, and, and, and they don't want to go there because it just brings back memories of their parents and grandparents and people that they have known and have been linked to through the, you know, through the dis oh, disasters yeah. and the Holocaust. So his was not a good taste. He, 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 okay. he, he would but, not... But he's been to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum? Well, we don't know. Okay, <laughs> we're going to show you um, what the Yad Vashem Center looks like. And it actually means the names. And you'll see how it starts out with lots of names of people who have died. But uh, a lot of times I tell people I've studied at Yad Vashem and they, have, they don't have a clue what I mean. So in this presentation, you'll see exactly where we studied and what it's about. Now let's take you inside Yad Vashem where you'll find pictures, artwork, letters, and other original documents from the Holocaust. Our guide, Malky Weisberg, shows us what life was like for the Jews there and how they lost everything except their faith in a merciful God. Let's take a look. <laughs> Enter the Holocaust History Museum, which everyone would expect to start with horrible pictures of death and dying and corpses, etc. We start this museum with life because, in order to understand the magnitude of the loss that the Jewish people experienced during the Holocaust, we have to understand what they had before. What was life like before? And a very famous Israeli photographer by the name of Michal Ravner put together a very interesting screen in front of us with pictures that she took, actual live, real pictures from the 1920s and early 30s of Jews and their life before. And by watching this exhibit and watching this film, you get a feeling for regular life and regular people. And it's a very important message for us here in Yad Vashem. This was regular life, and all of a sudden this regular life stops and we're on the gray unfinished flooring, showing us how shocking and how different and how unusual it was for people to just leave everything that was normal and get to everything that was not. And if you take a look at the architecture, the building is a triangle, digging into the ground like a saw, making the cemetery for the six million who were not given proper Jewish burial. And you notice we're underground. The museum is also built like a maze, ins and outs and under and over, and you, you get lost in here. What's the message? That's how the Jews felt. They were looking for a place to hide, a place to run, a place to exist when their existence was being snuffed out. We're standing in front of the cattle car that we have here in Yad Vashem. I don't think we could ever imagine the feelings going through people who are pushed together on a cattle car meant for animals and being taken to a place where they are about to be slaughtered. We're standing at the Rappaport Memorial in the Warsaw Ghetto Square, and this is a replica of Nathan Rappaport's um, piece of art which stands in Poland, in Warsaw. The interesting thing about the Rappaport Memorial and the bricks is those were bricks that Hitler's um, people bought in order to make a monument to Hitler when they win the war. But it didn't happen, thank God, and instead it was used for a memorial for the Jews. And you'll 
take a little look at the artwork here, and here you have the Jews of Warsaw being forced into the death camps, being forced onto the trains, and you see despair, and you see a lot of sadness. And if you look at this part of the monument, you see the Water, Warsaw Ghetto fighters. You see the spirit of not despairing, but let's fight back. That is Beit Zayit, and that is Mivaseret. This is all very, very beautiful view. And after I give a tour, it's, it's very exciting to give a tour of the destruction and come out to this, because this is a tour of the rebirth of yeah. Jewish families uh, growing and children laughing yeah. and something that Hitler never planned on. Every day in our prayers we say, V'li Yerushalayim Ircha Berachamim Tashuv. And to Jerusalem, your city, in my mercy, will you return. And return we have big time. I think that gives you a really good picture, doesn't it, Melanie, of yes. what, what was it like for you when you went to Yad Well, I mean, obviously, here? you know, a lot of the uh, presentations of, of the Holocaust and of the War Museum um, are gentle, let's put it that way. Um, but when you're actually there and you see the photographs, um, it is, there, there are times where you can't look. You do turn away and you either cry or pray or something, but... Um, there's something about the way they have put it together that does give you the sense that there is that will to live, that will as a people, you know, the Jewish people, that they will still carry on, uh, you know, yeah. making music, writing books and poetry, they will carry on yeah, yeah, yeah. living. And it's, uh, it is very inspiring. Yeah. I think for me, one of my most memorable mm -hmm. times, I wouldn't even call it memorable, it was like shocking. And while I was probably in my 20th hour of Holocaust studies, and uh, they did a little surprise. That, that was very shocking, to say the least. And I'd never seen Schindler's List before. Had you? You just The movie. Have the movie? you seen the movie? I'm, the whole I'm, movie. I'm still holding off. You're still <laughs> holding off. Okay. But I saw the last, and they showed us the, in, in classroom at Yad Vashem, which you've just seen, they showed us the last 45 minutes of Schindler's List, and you're just in tears. I mean, it's just so emotional, and you hear and that so, But some people don't music. know who Schindler is, so maybe yeah, you'd like I'm, to explain. I'm explaining. So Schindler was, um, was a very wealthy German man who saved the lives of hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of Jews. And through so his Steven factory. Spielberg, through yeah. his factory, yes. by giving them work, and Steven Spielberg produced a wonderful film. By the way, very accurate. I mean, every Jewish person I've met, including the professor, said, no, he did a, yes. he did a really good job. Yeah. So anyway, we saw 45 minutes of that, and then we were handed a list. And I was going to bring it with me, but I forgot it. And we were handed, handed the actual you know, five pages a of copy. Schindler's A copy list. of that. A copy, yes. not the original, of, of course. Both of us received one of those. And then we were just like reading through it and <laughs> they were explaining about it. And then suddenly there was like a knock at the door. And guess who came? You know, you could just read the numbers, two or three, da 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 da, 105, 78, whatever. And then a woman came through. She must have been in her late 80s, early 90s. And uh, she was number 201. Eva? <laughs> Lovey, uh, it was just. I also <laughs> saw her and got, got a photograph of her, yeah. and it was just amazing to meet her and to hear her story. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I Incredible. had a, a good conversation with her, and she knew Schindler and his family and everything. Yes. But he said he was a good man. He had his imperfections, but he was a good man. And just seeing her, she was so full of. I don't know what it is. I think I met about three or four Holocaust survivors, and every single one of them that I personally met. I don't know about Melanie. They were full of humor. They were playful. It, you just can't imagine that these women, all in their 90s, went through horrific experiences mm. like that. I mean, man, in, in the States, we, I don't know, we have to, we have to take the bus today. <laughs> you know, I mean, whoa, <laughs> taking the bus today, you know, yeah. poor old you. But what these people went through, they're alive. They're not on medication. They're, they're just yeah. wonderful people mm. with a lot of strength and enthusiasm. And they're inspired to live and they're inspiring to be around. Mm. I think mm -hmm. that when they uh, teach about their experiences, there's something that's imparted to the new ger generation that is completely, um, that you can't actually find anywhere else. Somebody who's been through these kind of experiences and, and being able to just say how they felt and what they did, and that, you know, that their race, basically, their, not their race, but their group of people was destined to be obliterated. 
it's a huge, huge thing. And I think um, the young people of today, uh, what a privilege to be able to meet a, a Holocaust survivor and be able to hear the stories and to see the, um, the desire to live, the desire for young people to be able to find their dreams and go for it. Yeah. Well, the next scene you're going to see right now is truly emotional. For some reason, I didn't make it to the gravesite of Schindler, Oscar Schindler. Neither did you. Okay. Now, you had rain. Okay, you had rain. I went to the ladies' room and missed my bus. <laughs> she missed the bus. So for some reason, we weren't allowed to, you know, to the, go to the gravesite. But this is a scene where some of the people that were saved, okay, by Schindler, they live in Jerusalem, and there be, some of them are too old to walk, so they have to be accompanied by their children, and they place rocks, you know, on the gravesite, symbolizing and saying thank you to what Schindler did. He was a righteous among the nations, yes. somebody who risked his life to save Jewish people. And it's an emotional scene. It, it really is. Wow, uh, just that music. I mean, if he hadn't done that, those people wouldn't be there. Yeah, 6,000 descendants. I mean, it's incredible that actually came from uh, Schindler's, the, the Jews that Schindler was um, instrumental in, in you know, keeping alive. Eva, who we both met, literally yes. was taken from Auschwitz, yes. from certain death by Schindler and given a job in the factory, even though she was, I think, the youngest member 
on yes, that list. Yes, yes, she was. She was. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, I, I, I can't help thinking about the how alive Jerusalem is, how the Jewish people have such a sense of community. I mean, it's, yeah, I think it's very difficult with our lifestyles, Westerners who tend to live in our own apartments or our own houses, and we don't seriously have a community. Obviously, the church mm -hmm. for us as Christians does that. But as a culture, when you are Jewish, you know, you're involved in everybody's lives and there's, you know, various rituals and things that you do through the year, uh, which bring that oneness. And I just sense that there's such a sense, I mean, right from Abraham, this survival, this, this, you know, this, uh, this joy to live, this intense necessity to just keep on going. It's just such an admirable, admirable and amazing thing to see. But that's true. In Jerusalem, they seem more alive than anywhere else in the world. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> I don't know. Some I was really touched in, in Jerusalem. I was for life. I mean, after people have gone through so much and they're still going through so much politically and, and all that, but there just seems to be this sense of life, this sense of community. This, and, and I mean, when I read how many inventors and people who've won awards for innovative things and you see how many Jews on those lists, it's incredible. It absolutely is incredible. Yeah. Now, your memorable moment with the Holocaust survivor and there's a picture of you with her as well. What's her name? Tell us about her a little bit, because we're going to see her. She's going to speak oh, to us. So this now. is, are you talking about uh, um, Eva Lavi? Nope. Oh, I mean, the other yeah, one. Yeah. Oh, sorry, because I saw both. Yeah. Judith Kleinman. Um, she was very quiet. She was quite frail, and she walked into our um, lecture room, and she sat there, and she started to relate her story and uh, we were just absolutely spellbound and she spoke about these three choices she had to make between uh the years where she was five to seven years old we'll be seeing that in the clip in the yes mm -hmm. and uh, it was just you know no child should have to make these kind of decisions uh you know you should be a child and so it's a very very touching story and we are going to see yeah. some of her story so we can't play at all because it's like 26 minutes long, but we'll play just a few minutes of it and then we'll continue on with the story. One day in uh, January 1944, my happy childhood came to an end. It all began when my mother was called to the public phone, which was at the entrance to our building. She went downstairs and I, as usual, followed her. I couldn't hear what she said because she whispered into the phone. But when she put down the phone, I saw that she was pale. I asked, Mama, why are you pale? What happened to you? But my mother didn't answer me. She went quickly upstairs, and she and grandmother packed in a hurry two suitcases. I asked, Mama, where are we going? But again, my mother didn't answer me. And I felt, I sensed that something terrible was going to happen. My mama and my nonna took the two suitcases and I took my doll, Angelica, and I embraced her to, to me. We went in silence. After a long walk, we reached a big building. Inside a room stood a Nazi by his desk. He ordered my mother and grandmother to sit on a bench that was in that room. To my surprise, I saw there our Christian neighbor, who also sat down on that bench next to my mother. The Nazi told me to stand by his side. Then he asked me in a regular voice, what is your name? I said, Judita. He asked, with whom do you want to go, Judita? I knew I had to answer right away, and I looked at my mother. But I didn't recognize my mother for a minute. She looked so different, so strange. She looked as if she had a white mask on her face. And her eyes, that always looked at me with love, looked at me as if they said, Danger, don't choose me. I didn't understand why, but I pointed at the Christian neighbor. At that minute, the Nazi shouted something and two soldiers came in. 
They grabbed my grandmother by her shoulders and pushed her out of the room. Then they went towards my mother. When I realized that she too would soon disappear, I ran to her. But when I almost reached her, the Nazi caught me and held me tight. My mother stretched out, out her arms to me, but the Nazi drew me back. My mother opened her mouth to say something to me, but no word, no sound came out. I cried, Mama, Mama, but they brutally pushed her out of the room. I stood by the empty bench and I knew I was alone. Suddenly, uh, the Christian neighbor came to me, held my hand, and took me out of the room. She told me that she couldn't keep me because she was poor and had five girls of herself, but she would bring me to a place where I will be taken care of, and she brought me to a convent. Well, that's part of the story. If we played it, it would be a little too long, but just to, to fill in just such an emotional story. So when she finally gets to the convent, um, the mother superior really takes her under her wing and the great love between them. And then there's other girls of different ages and you find that, uh, that they are basically warning Judith not to, to basically to say that she is Christian, she is not Jewish. And so she explains how she basically has these two lives, one in the evening where she says her prayers and remembers her mother and she knows she's Jewish. And the other one is during the day with all these, uh, you know, Christians. And, and then you've got the, uh, you know, obviously um, the, the nuns and the mother superior saying, you are, you know, a Christian. And, 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 and actually a very amusing thing she, she tells us is that uh, in order to make sure that all the girls in the, in the convent are on the same page, they basically say, well, a Christian always has a belly button that's stuck in. So let's see if you have an in indented belly button. Belly button. So anyway, so they say, see, now we know, you know that you are Christian because you've an indented belly button. Mm -hmm. And she was rather confused and everything. It's just, and actually when, when the, the Nazis came and they said, oh, are there any um, Jewish girls in here? None of the girls were frightened into giving Judith away because they all knew she was Christian because of her belly button, because of course they were all young. And the, uh, the beautiful story continues how uh, two people come and after the war, and these are Jewish people that have come to collect uh, Jewish children and return them to what will be Israel. And uh, it's just a beautiful story. And then one of the things the way she follows up is how when she actually ends up in um, what would be Israel in the future, uh, she, she looks at the other orphans uh, belly buttons and she says they are all in and then she realized what what had happened <laughs> and uh, You just see that the simplest thing actually saved her life and it actually becomes a, a bit of comic relief in the midst of all the suffering and uh, Yeah, that that video insert basically is called all my mothers and so she did she had a number of mothers and she was never um, you know re reunited with her with her parents or her family, but she did have somebody, I wow. believe, in the UK. Wow, wow. So a beautiful story uh, of somebody who's brave and, and uh, having to, to deal with the loss of all her family in the Holocaust. I think out of all the Holocaust survivors, a person I would have wanted to meet had to be the famous psychiatrist Victor, Victor Frankl, because my dad is a psychiatrist. I kind of have psychology and psychiatry in my blood, and I, I really admire Victor Frankl, who who wrote in Man's Search of Meaning, and I love his work. Uh, even though he's Jewish, a lot of Christians use his work as well. And he says, unlike Freud, who says sex is the meaning of life, you know, Viktor Frankl says, no, it's actual, it's meaning. You have to have a purpose, you have to have a meaning. That's what life is like. And so when he was caught by the Nazis, when he was in Vienna and taken to a concentration camp, I remember somebody telling me the story in Jerusalem. He just, he knew what was gonna happen to him, and he saw a fence there. And he said, you know what, I'm just going to throw myself against that f fence and I know someone's going to shoot me, but it'll be all over again. Well, the fences no were electrified. Suffering. You actually just yeah, touched yeah, them yeah. and you electrocuted. And yeah. if you touch anybody... I don't anybody, know this particular fence. Okay, yeah. But what happened is there was a young woman who smiled at him. And just that smile kept him going, saying, you know what, 
there's love, there's meaning, there's purpose in life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it through this camp. And Viktor Frankl would always talk about prisoners who, even prisoners who had just enough to eat, many of them would die not because of malnourishment, although that happened, but really because of lack of purpose, lack of hope, lack of faith in the future. And just something powerful happened to him. And he said, you know what? I have hope. You wow. know what? I'm going to survive. You know what? I'm going to get out of here. And then he started imagining himself, I think, at like Harvard University, Yale, one of the American Ivy League universities, teaching students about he, what he learned through the Holocaust. Wow. So guess what? There's very few videos of Viktor Frankl speaking. It's like you know, seeing you know, Freud or Jung or somebody speak, but actually we're going to show um, him speaking to, um, I don't know where he's speaking, but he's a humorous guy, he's a survivor, and he made it out, and he's full of life, and listen to this. They wish to make a lot of money. In Europe, every American student, if more every American adult, is regarded as someone who is just out to make a lot of money. Really, 16%, 16% of these students regarded their main goal and concern in life to make a lot of money. I'm quoting literally, make a lot of money. And you know what the top class, the top category, we say category, category, what do you say? Category was among, you excuse me, but uh, I know I am speaking a marvelous accent without the slightest English. Now. <laughs> You know, you know what the top category was? 78% of these American youngsters were concerned as they expressed it themselves with finding a meaning and purpose in their lives. So this is realistic, a realistic view on man. And you know, You won't believe it. Gray, uh, gray hair, my age, I started taking flying lessons recently. Do you know what my flying instructor told me? If you are starting here, wish to get here, say east, heading for this, and you have a crosswind, you will drift and you will land here so you have to do what we pilots call a crabbing, he told me, C-R-A-B, crabbing. You have to head for north of this uh, air, airfield, and you have to fly that way, you see, as if you headed in this direction. If you are heading here above this airfield, then you will actually land here. But if you head for here, you are landing here. This holds also for man, I would say. If we, if we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him, it's premature, your applause, you will soon know why. If we, if we seem to be idealists and are overestimating, overrating man and looking at him that high here above, you know what happens? We promote him to what he really can be. So we have to be idealists in a way because then we we'll wind up as the true, the real realist. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse, but if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. This was not my flight instructor, this was not me, this was Goethe. He said this verbally. And now you will understand why I, in one of my writings, once said, this is the most apt maxim and motto for any psychotherapeutic activity. So if you don't recognize 
a young man's will to meaning, man's search for meaning. You make him worse, you make him dull, you make him frustrated, you still add and contribute to his frustration. While if you presuppose in this man, if in this so-called criminal or juvenile delinquent or drug abuse and so forth, there must be a a, what we call spark, yeah? a spark of search for meaning. Let's recognize this, let's presuppose it, and then you will elicit it from him, and you will make him become what he in principle is capable of becoming. My wife just asked me a very interesting question. She said, Kurt, how do you want to relate this to the Holocaust? And I think it has everything to do with the Holocaust. Because if you were in a concentration camp, you knew you and your whole family would be wiped out. That almost appears meaningless. Mm, mm. I mean, he lost many of his family members. So somehow, you know, he found his purpose in that, con in that, in that concentration camp. He said that they could take my life away, mm. they could take all my goods away, they could take my clothes away, but they can't take my freedom to choose mm. how I'm going to live my life and how I'm going to respond. So if they asked him to clean 20 toilets, he would go and clean 30 toilets. You see, he knew that even facing death, he could choose, still choose life mm. and not death. And it was really interesting because a lot of the prisoners that were in there, he said even it wasn't due to malnutrition. So many people, he would just wake up to his friend and his friend would be dead. Yes. Not because of malnutrition, almost because of a lost heart, a broken, broken heart. heart yeah. the, the, there was no purpose. The, his per the person sleeping next to him just gave up his will mm. to live. So as a psychiatrist, and I tend to trust somebody mm. who has not only learned their psychiatry in the University of Vienna, but learned it in the ghettos and the concentration camps, mm you can't fool around, it's a life or death situation. So he's almost saying to us, choose life so that you can live and not death. So I think it's no matter how it relates to us and how it inspires us to live, you might think you have it bad. I don't know, maybe your marriage or relationship has failed, you know, maybe you've lost all of your money, maybe you've lost your health, but still you're not in Auschwitz, still, your neighbor is not getting burnt alive in an oven. Still, you know, no matter where you are in life, you have a choice. You can choose life and purpose, or you can just give in to despair, which sometimes it's, it's very easy. We can mm. understand that. But when you say, how does it relate to the Holocaust and how would it relate to our lives? I, I think all of us, maybe you don't have a problem now. I mean, they say there's two types of people, those who have problems, and those who are about to have problems. So the next time we're in a situation, you know, sometimes we are in a concentration camp, we're in our own interior prison, but we can choose, by choosing life, we can get out of it. Mm. Does that answer it more or less? Or? Yeah, it does. It, it does yeah. definitely. What would you say? I mean, I'm, I'm, for me, I think the phenomenal and most impressive thing is seeing a people who've almost been wiped out and visiting Israel, visiting Jerusalem, and seeing the incredible buzz. I mean, <laughs> I arrived <laughs> in one of those uh, those kind of taxi things. Uh, what are they called? Uh, I forget. No what it, or whatever. Oh, yeah. Anyway, and uh, and it was it was on Shabbat, so it was on the Saturday evening. You know, um, you know after Shabbat, yeah. and the the all the restaurants and everything was just buzzing, and I wow so much life and you have all the Hasidim and every, every kind of Jewish person out on the streets eating and being together. And I just thought, wow, that is really impressive. Okay. And uh, just that, that, that sense of what they've been through. And then a lot of people have come from all over the world, made a you know, where they've mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, basically relocated themselves to Israel now. And uh, they have, they've had to, give up everything to move from their own culture. There's so many languages, <laughs> so many cultural differences, but yet there's a oneness and there's an excitement about being a people unified. And, uh, you know, I think for Christians, we can learn a lot about that because sometimes we 
keep ourselves to ourselves and we don't realize how impactful it is to be part of something that is so much bigger than just ourselves. Yeah. When I was in Israel, I just found a lot of people struggling with the Holocaust. Mm. I remember meeting a, a former, one of my tour guide, he was um, on the last day, young guy, probably in his 30s, and he was an Orthodox Jew, but he left the faith. Mm. And because when you think of the Holocaust and you read, you know, what we call the Old Testament and about how God brought an army against somebody, it's very painful for mm. them. Th think about it. If mm -hmm. they go to the Holocaust Museum and y you love God and you follow his laws and then you go and you see that happen, it's almost like, God, how can you, you know, allow so much evil in the world? And where were you? That happen. Yeah, and, that's, and asking where were you during that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and I, I can see for a young person who just wants to get in technology and Facebook and live their life, like, Holocaust? I don't want to study that. I, I don't want to be reminded of that. I don't want to serve a God who, you know, allows, you know, millions of people to be killed. So you have those deep questions, which we see even in the book of yes, Job. Yes, yes, yeah. You, yeah. You know, it's hard. So it's like, well, what's going to happen with us now? I mean, we thought the Jews were maybe doing bad things in the 1930s or the 40s, but what about now? The Jews. The Jews people. Oh, okay. The Jewish Is something else going to happen? You know, so you, you have a real tension. And when I was in Israel, they just grill you. They, you, you, you can't say a little trite answer. You can't just say, oh, God will comfort you. Well, Kurt, how is he going to comfort me? How has he comforted you? And they, they kind of put, interrogate you mm. almost, mm. you know, they do that. Well, I think they have a, th a thirst for, for knowledge. They definitely, I've seen, um, you know, many of them th studying and uh, trying to see their way through things that are problematic. You know, I mean, for me, often I have to put things on a shelf when I don't have the immediate answer. But I love the idea of the, the way that even as a community, they grapple with things. They grapple with questions. They grapple with some of the hardest things to be able to try and understand why certain human uh, things take place, you know, the, the evil on the earth and, and various other things. And especially with the Holocaust, I think a lot of Jews, uh, well, I mean, uh, Gentiles as well are looking, you know, why did this happen? And how can we stop this from happening again? And, you know, as we see the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, it's just so important that we keep this alive and we say this happened to a very, uh, you know, on a grand scale, you know, from a very educated place in Europe, um, incredibly Well, well so. let, let, let's slow down here. I mean, th I think that's a lesson because if you look at Germany, hold on, the war ended in 1945. That means the war ended 15 years before both of us were born. I yeah. mean, that's 15 years, hey, it's nothing. Man, it's nothing. You <laughs> yeah. know, believe me, it's nothing. I'm 57 years old. How did that happen? I, I don't know. But Germany at that time had the most Nobel Prize winners, right. Uh, right. physicists. It was right. a, probably, you know, one of the most educated, you know, nation in the history of the world at that time. You even had Einstein, mm. Einsteinberg. You have the, some of the most famous scientists, but yet this happened. Mm. I mean, that in itself has to be a lesson to us. We think we're impermeable. We think that that's not going to happen to us. Mm. I mean. World War I happened. We're, we'll never have another war in Germany. In fact, a lot of theologians after, in Germany after World War I, I think Karl Barth was one of them, said, oh, we've had our war, you know, it's not going to happen again. Mm. We've learned. Mm. There's an age of God's favor coming in, and bam, you know, World War II happened, mm. and people lost a lot of faith. But I'm going to introduce you to somebody, and she's 109 years old. Now, I've met somebody who's been 104 years old, but never 109 years old. So she was the oldest Holocaust survivor. And this is her answer. And this is how she survived, you know, such horrors, but also to be 109. Come on, that's impressive in itself. So enjoy this. What is the secret of you feeling so good at your age? What is the secret? What can you tell Op people? Optimism and looking for the good. Life is beautiful. Happy, to be happy, to admire, to, to thank. Thankful that we are living. Wherever you look is beauty. 
And you see beauty everywhere. You see beauty everywhere. Yeah. You see, you see the beauty everywhere. Everywhere. I know about the bad thing, but I look to the everywhere. good things. Wow, that is absolutely incredible to watch somebody who's been through all that and then just that glow on her face, just saying that the joy of living, the, the privilege of life. And I think, you know, when we look through the lenses of the Holocaust, I think one of the things that we ask ourselves is, well, do we not value life? Do we not value other people? Do we not, um, do we distance ourselves from other people who are different from us? Is that why we are not sympathetic towards other people's plights. And I think, I mean, it's still, it's still going on today. There's so much going on all around the world, not only to Jews, to, to other uh, people groups as well. And I think the big question is, you know, how can we be inspired to live? How can we be inspired to overcome um, if we can't even love our neighbor, if we can't love those who are different from us? And I think the challenge, you know, this uh, Holocaust remembrance time is to really say, you know, are we that different? We're not that different. We're all created in the image of a loving God. And, uh, and so the, the, I believe that the, the, um, the deep and profound thing is to say, these are people created, created so that we could all live together and be in a place where we can use each other's gifts, enjoy each other's differences. And so Kurt, I just wanted to say that in, in the yeah. light of what, yeah. what she said. Well, I think we could even give another title to this program. Mm. We could say our own lives through the lens of the Holocaust. Mm. Can we look at the Holocaust and imagine ourselves going through that and look at our lives through the lens of the Holocaust. And what I mean by that is I started out earlier in the program saying I, I've done probably well of maybe 120 funerals at the most. And I always ask funeral directors, you know, what can I learn from you? And every single one, without exception, appreciate life. Mm. Live life to the fullest. Mm. Carpe diem, seize the day. Um, value what you have, not just what you don't have. Focus on your family, your friends, what you have. Don't focus on what you have. And you don't really have problems. Mm. That's what they're saying. Yeah. I think so many times, like the 109-year-old woman, her secret was to see the beauty and everything. For example, in Scripture, I mean, Paul's in jail at Philippi, and he says, think of things. He does the same thing. Just yes. realize that. Yes, yes. Paul did the same thing as that woman. Yeah. He said, think of things that are good, that are praiseworthy, that are excellent. You know, think of things that are beautiful. Mm. And that's exactly what she did. Right. But you know you what know? I was thinking is sometimes when we are uh, insular or inward thinking, we don't have that like top of the mountain um, kind of view or perspective. And I think when we look at, um, I mean, we're fortunate enough to have the internet and everything, but when we look at other people's lives, other people's lifestyles, their cultures, the things that they love, the different kind of foods they like, and then we look at that without being threatened, but looking in a way that is respectful and intriguing, I just can't see how we can be nasty and horrible and, and talk badly about other racial groups or other the cultural groups or religious groups. And I think that's what pleases God. I think God really loves the way that he has made diversity. And if we can appreciate that, I don't think we have another Holocaust coming, <laughs> but it's just to get that word out there. And it's to, to see people's hearts change really. Yeah. But you know, one thing I've learned from this program is everybody that was interviewed had a future hope. Mm. You know, God said to Jeremiah, even when they were in captivity in Babylon, he said, I know the plans that I have for you, you know, to bring you a future and a hope. And I think in our heart of hearts, a lot of us don't believe that. Mm. We look at the circumstances, but man, let's face it, our circumstances are not as bad as somebody who was in Auschwitz. Viktor Frankl faced that oven, yet he believed that he had a future and a hope. And I think my prayer for myself, for you, Melanie, for our viewers tonight, is that God, we would know that we have a good future, a good hope. I love this scripture. I was watching a program, Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi of London, 
And we were um, discussing he was commenting on this about and, Moses. And it's about Moses. Yeah. And Moses gives his last three sermons in the book of Deuteronomy. He's sw seen people being swallowed up by the earth. I mean, he's <laughs> doubted God. I mean, Moses <laughs> had so many problems, <laughs> you know, when you're ever in, that, in that desert for 40 years. Uh, you know, that, that's hard. And, and, and he wasn't even allowed to go into the promised land. So that, that's tough. You know, he had a hard life, but yet it says this about, um, about him in Deuteronomy 34, 7. It says this, Moses was 120 years old, even older than that woman. And when he died, and he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. And, you know, the rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, was saying, yeah, I never put those two verses together. It says, you know, his eyes were good, but yet he had plenty of strength left until he was reading and meditating on it. And he saw it kind of metaphorically. He said Moses' vision was good because he had a goal. He had an ideal. He had a future. He had a hope. He could see the promised land right in front of him. He had a, a window of hope, even the prophet Daniel. When we meet him in Babylon, he had his routine where he prayed three times a day. But guess what? In his house, all his windows that were open faced Jerusalem. That's right. Not the hanging gardens of Babylon, but Jerusalem. And I think as human beings, we need purpose. Mm. That's exactly what mm. Rick Victor Frankl said. And mm. God offers us that purpose. Even the Apostle Paul said, I would love to just die right now and be with Jesus. But my purpose is to work for your joy. Isn't that great? Yes, it My is. purpose, I live, I breathe, not to take care of myself, you know, of course I'll eat, but I'm living to work for your progress in the faith and that your joy in the faith would overflow. And when we have that vision for other people, yes. like Oscar Schlinder did, suddenly life is worth living mm. because it's not about us, mm -hmm. okay? You, you might have, a, we might have incredible problems but we're not in Auschwitz. We're not in the concentration camp, you know? We are in a position where we can start saving other people mm. just like Oscar Schlinder did. And we have that opportunity to work for people's joys, to set the captives free, because, hey, let's face it, we're free. Yeah, well, we have the, the good news, and uh, the good news is that Jesus Christ died for us, and uh, we have a, a hope and a future, and uh, you know, just looking, uh, going back to, to Jerusalem again, and just looking at the, the life and the, the vibrancy of uh, the people that live there. Hmm. Um, you know, the scripture says that we should uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and uh, we do that. We do that as a family. I've, we trained our children up to, to pray, and we encourage you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that's every people group there. That's the Palestinians, that's the Jews, that's the foreigners, that's whoever's there. And, uh, and let's remind ourselves that uh, we have the potential to be able to stop um, the horrors that could and possibly can take place in the future with our prayers, with our personal attitude towards things. And uh, so we want to encourage you. We want to encourage you today to have uh, um, a sense of what y God has for your life ahead and to be a blessing and to be called to touch the nations through prayer, through whatever you do in your life and to know that your life matters. Yeah, I think when I was in history class, I remember my professor saying, one thing you learn about history is we don't learn, you know, what was it? <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't learn, we learn from history that we don't learn from history. Yes. In other words, let's keep the Holocaust at this time in the Memorial Week, the Memorial Day. Let's remember it not to bring us down, but to, live us up, to lift ourselves up. Let's not focus on the tragedy, but let's focus on the future and the hope that we have in our God. Inspired to live. So we want to thank you for joining us this beautiful Holocaust uh, week, and uh, God bless you. Be inspired, live well. God bless you. Goodbye.